Hello, and welcome to the live Printing Impressions webinar, Automating, Streamlining, and Optimizing the Folding Process, sponsored by MBO America. I'm Patrick Henry, Senior Editor for Napco Media's Printing and Packaging Publishing Group, and the moderator of today's event. Before we get started, please let me take a moment to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the Tech Tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget for more information. And please do be sure to use the Q&A button in the bar on the bottom of the display to send us your questions at any point during the webinar. Uh, to help us learn more about getting the most from folding equipment and folding workflows, we are very fortunate to have with us today Lance Martin, Vice President of National Accounts, MBO America, and Tim Meredith, who is General Manager, Good Printers. MBO America is a leading developer of high-performance folding and finishing solutions for conventional, digital, and hybrid printing operations. Based in Bridgewater, Virginia, Good Printers provides commercial printing, publication printing, and mailing services to clients in the Washington, D.C. area and the Shenandoah Valley, uh, Shenandoah Valley areas. As the title of our program indicates, our focus today is going to be on making the folding process as efficient and co as cost efficient and productive as possible. Now, this also happens to be the mission of MBO America. So, Lance, let's please begin with you. Great, thanks, Pat. Uh, welcome, everybody, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lance Martin. I'm the Vice President of National Accounts at MBO. Uh, America. And uh, I think we're going to have a nice discussion today talking about the entire folding process. Uh, and you'll notice it's a rather long um, a long title. It, it includes not only automating, but it, it includes the words streamlining and optimizing. Um, today in our, in our industry, people say, let's automate this. And many times, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you automate um, features of a machine. Uh, what many times it means is you put multiple processes together or um, figure out ways to optimize the characteristics of the machine. And it may very well include automating um, uh, because that's a very popular uh, uh, thing to, to do in our industry today because of the turnaround times and such. But uh, uh, I hope today we give you an example of some of the many things that you could take a look at also. And I think our example today um, of working with good printers uh, will prove that. It, it not only has uh, the, opt the automation function in it, but it had some very interesting characteristics that we had to tackle um, that uh, uh, proved, proved good. So let's go on. I think I'm going to show you um, just a, a moment uh, about MBO. Um, one of the reasons we have the ability to take a look at not only the automation but streamlining the process is you can see the way the group is built. Um, MBO Group is actually a, a, a conglomerate of many divisions, uh, all with certain specialties. Uh, you can see America here, which is the largest group in, within MBO, and uh, we're uh, about half the business of the entire company. Um, that's due to mostly to the to the area of coverage of in North America is a major business part in the printing industry. But then you'll also see the Herzog and Hyman company, which is actually still branded Herzog and Hyman, but it is part of the MBO group, and they bring along all the specially finishing components of the company. Uh, they are famous in the world for uh, working with uh, bad papers, as I, I like to say, but it's the pharma stocks and the very light and slick stocks. Uh, their folders have a lot of custom pieces, and we've learned how to manage paper and handle paper through that company a little bit differently sometimes. Uh, MBO Germany is where all of our research and development and a lot of our uh, assembly is being done. Uh, the Portugal facility is a, um, it's a manufacturing facility of nearly a quarter of a million square feet that allows us uh, to manufacture components, parts, and assemblies and build the machinery for the world. And then we've also made big steps with a lot of our partners, and I think that's really key these days because the processes that we're, we're working with in the, uh, in the printing industry have 
many times gone outside of the core businesses of most companies, and we've elected to solve most of those problems by making excellent partnerships. So uh, many times you'll see a, uh, that we are actually playing a bit of an integrator to get a lot of these things done, and I, I think that's a very positive, positive move. I wanted to give you just a couple of milestones of why we're having this discussion today. Um, you will see, uh, I, this is a lengthy list and I promise I won't go over it, uh, but I want to just draw your attention that uh, if you look down the list, you can see that there's quite a bit of activity, uh, although sparingly throughout the years, as the industry was developing and the folding business was only, the first machines were only put out in the mid-60s. Up through about the uh, 2005 and 8 range, uh, there was quite a bit of, of development on core technology. And then you can see a little bit of a stop after 2008. And of course, that was our recession. And uh, you'll, you know, there was a lot of consolidation going on and, and, and uh, internal focusing to find out how we're going to get through this. And then you'll see in the last five years, 2013 and on, you're going to see a flurry of new uh, platforms and new uh, technology has come on, and that that is the same for us. We've put out a different controls platform with new folder configurations and features and enhancements and speeds, and uh, and along with that, there's some partner solutions in here that were were not even mentioned that'll be that'll be uh, uh, brought to light today. So I'm that's all I wanted to show on that screen is to uh, is to really make everybody known that. Even though this is the offset business and the digital world seems to be taking all the, uh, the attentions and the headlines today, we are still making big advancements into the production of the offset uh, sheet and get it into products, of course, that people can, uh, can, can purchase from you. Because it's really tough to uh, purchase a flat sheet or a roll, isn't it? So this uh, puts us in, I just have a quick market overview. We've, we've kind of put ourselves into four buckets with the commercial, digital finishing, die cutting, and specialty. And you can see after I told you about how the company is developed, uh, you know, we have, the, we have each group being able to, to contribute that way to get us into most of these markets very, very soundly. We've come with a basic group concept of putting modularity, flexibility, durability, performance, and the partnerships together. Uh, that's kind of the how. Uh, so the previous slides, I was kind of telling you the why piece, and this is the how piece that we're able to do that and take a step forward. So I'm going to jump now. Just take, I just wanted to take those couple of minutes. Going forward, I wanted to tell the story of what we see, and we'll see how many people in the audience have similar um, uh, experiences that can draw on and, and maybe we can we can draw some conclusions of how to go forward from that. So what we see in the current market is uh, there's a lot of in the offset business there's a lot of cost reduction going on. We have in the older days we had people that would call up and say, hey we need three folders to put on an extra you know 10 million pieces um, and we need to get it right now. And it was more of a of a getting equipment out into the market to take care of growth issues. As that flattened out and after 2008, um, now what we see is we see very much a cost reduction environment. And I think a lot of people will identify with that. Uh, I put a little picture here of a Komori press down in the lower right-hand corner. And I just did that to remind myself to speak to the similarities we're seeing that the press people are doing right now. So the press market has the same type of thing. They have non-perfecting, slower presses with older technology and non-automation. And they're taking in, maybe they're taking out two or three presses and putting in one. Well, what that really means is we're not growing in a volume uh, like two or three times the volume when you put a press like that in. What you're really doing is you're you're putting in one that takes the place of two or three, but the volume is staying the same, or maybe it grows a little bit, but it's not growing 100%. It maybe it's growth of 5 or 10% in volume. So uh, that's the same type of thing we're seeing here in the folding business. Uh, we also see an incredible labor issue, and it includes um, challenges of aging. Uh, the millennial uh, uh, the millennials are, have a, just a different way of operating and learning and, and, and running their lives. Um, the labor supply right now, of course, we all know we have a very 
um, low unemployment rates, which has its own issues to go with it. And then, of course, people are very cognizant of repetitive injuries and um, you know, repetitious type things for, for uh, knuckles and, and wrists and knees and such. Uh, and I put a reminder up here. I put an older style. You can see the, the, up here the, the face plate of an older folder, which was just a set of buttons and colors. Really didn't mean a whole lot. It was very manual. That's what you push. You had to know it. You had to memorize it. You had a training issue to do that. It was hard to throw a person at it. And nowadays, new folder technology platform uses controls in a much different way. Here you see an HMI of our new controls platform. And this, this is more of a, you know, of, of a touchy-feely uh, relationship type of a, of a user interface where I can see here's the buckle plates and you can kind of see how those would be and here's the feeder and, and so on. And you can touch those items and get you know, a response from the machine that goes to those items and that really helps. Uh, you see production rates and turnaround times. Uh, we have to get rates higher and turnaround times lower. Uh, assets are older. There's maybe 15,000 folders in North America. It's a conservative estimate on our part, but definitely older assets. Uh, and consolidations of companies have taken those assets and moved them into many locations or a single location sometimes. Uh, there's a a lot of used equipment out there, so you have that decision filtering into it where you have a relatively inexpensive used equipment solution of putting in technology from the 1990s and early 2000s into a 2018 and beyond market. Uh, space limitations are always in, the, in play where we've, we've put many machines to try to get uh, the production out, and we just don't have room to grow. Maybe we're landlocked, or it's just flat out costly on that part to keep expanding the building. Uh, and then maintenance costs can rise, and, and talents of maintenance, and old parts, and sourcing. And uh, generally, the market is non-automated, and that, that becomes an issue also. Um, the previous technology was typically um, a continuous feed, and uh, it, they were generally in the USA made up of buckle-style machines with standard hard rollers in them or possibly third-party rollers that are recovered or made by another manufacturer. Um, most all of them were manual. And the speed ratings were approaching the 200 meter a minute range maximum in those older vintages. And they don't run that fast anymore. You see a, uh, a four or 5,000 an hour, maybe 6,000 an hour range of what people say when we walk around and talk to them about what they budget for sheet speeds. And you end up also with an interesting thing that most of the folders out there have what we would call low-end or minimal uh, delivery sections. And that also puts an in a, a labor pressure onto the operation of the machine. You know, the, the guys at the end of the folder have very little chance. If you were able to speed up the machine twice as fast, they'd never be able to keep up. So we have more of a whole systems approach as to what's happening out there. And what's happening with newer technology today? So in the, that 2013 to now development period, what we have seen over the life of, of, or the recent life, is that you get you know, people looking at different feeding arrangements. And mostly it's been, how, are we, how can we eliminate some of the, the, the uh, worker issues with arms and you know, repetitive elbow problems and such? And well, maybe that's a pallet feeder. So that's been looked at. And the press industry, as it grows and makes better sheets and has UV and, and instantly cured sheets, well, we can also take use of that and go right from the pallet to the fold. Uh, combi folding machines are a big consideration nowadays because many times since, these, since companies have consolidated, you have incredibly large channels of, of work going through that a signature-based machine could work on. And the combi folder is great for that. It's, uh, it has some very unique characteristics. You can see one here in the middle is a combi machine that can do a six, you know, three folds, and then the buckle machine representation for three folds is on the bottom. You see, there's a space issue, there's an automation issue, and and so on. Um, we focus again on deliveries because of that line item number four. The maximum speeds of machines have increased incredibly. Uh, we're able to get most of our machines I mean, the max speed range, what we've introduced, is all 13,000 an hour and above. Uh, of course, that's max speed, not necessarily what it's going to do in performance on a sheet of your, uh, you know, of a specific style. And we always test for that to see what would happen. But uh, from a mechanical standpoint, that's what the capabilities are. 
And then we've been focusing on deliveries. You'll now see there's an automated delivery up on the top which uh, would spit out stacks of signatures onto a conveyor that has some length to it so that the operator has a little time. Uh, there's a little dwell time and one person can operate that machine. And I think the next piece, that cell operation concept, is really interesting. That's where people are actually trying to get, let's say, two machines back to back with opposing deliveries and have one guy run two machines. You know, in, in theory on a on a pallet fed machine, that should be possible, right? We we load in pallets of, of work and we get the machine started on an automated delivery that has some dwell time built into it for an operator. And that pallet feed should run out. Um, there's maybe as many as 10,000 sheets on that skid. So the machine will run for 10,000 sheets without any operator intervention, uh, unlike a continuous full feeder that uh, you may be uh, having to feed you know, handfuls of sheets continuously and then running back and catching up with the delivery. So those concepts are being used today, and it all depends on what your workflow is and, and how, uh, how long runs are and such. Um, we've also developed more types of rollers to be effective on different types of paper. Uh, the automation of the machine has been much more focused from the user interface down through the, the main mechanical parts of the machine have been uh, automated. And then there's a whole connectivity piece also in which uh, you know, we're connected up with the factory and, and through remote access. And then you're connected to your prepress, which you could literally download you know, common or, or even custom formats to the machine and have it preload or preset a lot of the uh, automated functions on that. Uh, and then I put an asterisk behind one item which is called modularity and that's just something that we have the ability to do and, and you're going to see that through our case study with good printers. Uh, they, they actually uh, had the ability to put on a, uh, an H&H, &H, uh, a Herzog and Hyman type of a of a folder component on the back end of the M80 and give it a new look. So that, that sort of thing is very popular nowadays is, and it helps you combining processes into one. Um, I'm going to go over this quick because it's kind of in-depth and if those of you that want to have this for permanent, you can certainly see it on your downloaded version. But this is just kind of a general overview of some of the real uh, effective or, or not so effective uh, bullet points or critical paths that each type of machine has. And I'm not going to go over every single one of them, but I'm going to let it be known here uh, that there's different types of folding methods now that we can consider for putting these things together. The combi folder would be a series of buckle plates and knives to get the job done. Uh, then you have a true buckle folder, which is predominantly what people are familiar with in the United States. It's usually a two or three or sometimes even four section buckle machine that can uh, buckle fold all the, the paper down to the format. And then now as the direct mail market gets up higher, we're turning more towards uh, what we call the, I guess you'd call it a plow fold or a folder gluer type of method where we have a vacuum table and, and mechanical plows that plow the paper over for heavy stock. A lot of these things are going way above what a buckle folder uh, or a knife folder is capable of folding uh, paper-wise up to you know, 9, 10, 12, 14, 16 points. And this will give you a further on top of that of what the lineup could be for you to take a look at. So there's all the small format things which have now become automated. Uh, there's a series of full format, the, the full sheet size uh, buckle machines. And then there's this whole f uh, host of full format, uh, 30 inch and above uh, formats for combi machines. And then this is a little known f fact about uh, folding going on right now is the landscape buckle machine. So there's a lot of efficiencies and speed upgrades that can be had by turning the sheet uh, landscape instead of portrait running through it because the machine can handle it a little bit quicker. And I'll go through a couple of speeds here on that in a minute. Uh, and then, of course, the plow folding techniques are all done on, on different types of tables and feeders. But this is the lineup you could bring to the table when you're discussing things. It's, it's, uh, it's rather formidable. And then we can add on also, if we get into anything incredibly thick, uh, this is a little typo right here, this 20 by 20. It should be 20 and 28, by the way. We'll correct that if any of you download this series. Um, but the entire load of 
what things could happen on the difficult papers and the pharma stocks and the thickness folds and knife folds and such are all available for us now to integrate into our folding machines. That's one of our MBO initiatives is to make use of all the components of MBO into the machinery. So I'm going to go over a little bit what, what we see as an analysis standpoint. And, and in the older process, um, we generally saw customers want to call up and say, send me a quote for um, you know, a folder that has three sections in it. And that's kind of the way the phone conversation went. Uh, the customer was looking at a new price from the manufacturer, uh, and then he had all those other things I mentioned earlier where he used a current price, um, or maybe it was a consolidation of another asset coming from another division. Uh, they would make their decision typically on what the lowest price was because you're kind of dealing on machinery that was you know all kind of typical technology back then and it, and you would hire a body and possibly you know two or three depending upon your shift work and you would you know basically move along the same path you were doing in the first place uh, so people are feeling the pain of doing that process nowadays and we've completely changed what we're looking at uh, the process now is usually what we see. There's not a whole lot of activity of people calling up and saying, hey, send me over three folders. I've got you know, 50 million new pieces to put out this year. Most of the time is, boy, I really need to figure out a way to get rid of a bottleneck. Or I need to figure out a way to get uh, my labor issues down because I'm having problems finding people. Or I really need to help with training. And we need to make the machine more repeatable because every time I get a different person in on shift one, the shift two guy changes it, and I don't get the same performance. Uh, and we see that a lot. And we also see a lot of bottlenecks. We see machines that are not able to take the flow of work from the machine ahead of them. For example, a guillotine cutter. Uh, if, the, if the folder could actually trim off you know, the four inches on the, on, the, on the wild side of the sheet and get rid of that, it could actually go straight to the folder. Uh, and not have to go to the guillotine cutter. So there you, you completely skip a step. Those are beautiful projects because the ROI is great. You literally skip a step, the throughput comes up, and the cost goes down. Uh, so we typically do something I like to call a follow the paper. Uh, we analyze the paper flow, and you find our salespeople and our, our engineers will walk in and they'll say, can you show me where the presses are? And how does the paper get from you know the end of the press to the job you're trying to do? And they'll want to see and, you know, does it go to the guillotine? Does it have to go to a scoring machine? Do you have to cut off something special or die cut it or any of that? And there's chances are now because of the integration and the modularity, maybe we can do something about that. And then, of course, we have to be willing to make a change. You'll see number five there is, is very important. A lot of the times the solutions we're going to get might change the imposition of the sheet. Um, and that may require you to back up in your process a little bit and have a little bit of a change. Um, so that, that's important, especially in that landscape method uh, I was talking about earlier. That, that would be something where we uh, would be, have to talk to you first about being willing to make a change. Uh, for example, if you fold a landscape product 16 versus a portrait product 16, you, know, you don't have your your pages 1 and 16 ending up in the same position, the same fold formats when it's printing, or in position formats when it's printing. But let's take an example of a 25 by 38 inch sheet on a portrait format. The maximum speed calculations is about 13,900 sheets an hour. But in a, in, a 20, in a 25 inch landscape format, that sheet could run well over 20,000 an hour. And we're not changing the speed, mechanical speed of the machine at all. It's just the fact that you're feeding the long edge versus the short edge. So those are big considerations, but of course your imposition would change. And you have to be willing to do things like that to get some, some of the performance changes out of it. Uh, we always are going through now a test and confirm, because usually the solutions are involving you know, folding specific types of paper for someone. It's not a very general situation all the time. Uh, and then we really want to focus in on number eight in this slide, which is training, training, training. That's an overlooked piece in the older days. We had a big labor pool from, to draw from that knew how to run those types of machines. And now that we have different machines with different technology and younger people that are not necessarily used to our, uh, our methods in the printing industry, we have to start making some serious investments in training.
I thought I would go over a small list of some of the most common projects before we jump into a sample case. Um, some of the things we see the most are labor issues. Um, and that has to do with repeatability of the machine, finding labor period. The cost of labor is going up in certain areas faster than others. And it, it's a real important part to try to make the machine incredibly user friendly so that you can put your local labor market on the machine without too much trouble. Um, probably the most common one uh, is number two uh, from a mechanical standpoint is literally taking steps out of a process. In other words, let's say you had to uh, um, you print, and then you went cut, and then you went fold. Well, let's build a folder that can eliminate the cut. So you skip the guillotine process, go right to the folder, and change your whole business that way. Uh, and many times we're able to do that if we take a look at what the formats are, what the size of the machines today are available, and we can maybe do that. Make ready is a big one. Um, with the choices of the different types of machines and putting automation in, and possibly even changing it from buckle to combi or similar, you can cut make readies in, um, in half or even more. We are typically talking to people that have hour-long make readies. And um, with the right situation, you can get those down to minutes. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, maybe, you know, maybe cut them in half as a, as a, uh, as a base. Um, we see a lot of channels within companies. So this is a common one for a commercial printer. You'll have a lot of volume, and you've got a You'll see you've got eight machines sitting in your folding area. And what we find if we analyze the workflow and we go ask what are the products and we get a list of them possibly, we're going to find out that let's say 40% of those are all signature based. And if we take a look at signatures and we specifically build a folder to do signatures, many times we can cut the, the footprint down. The Make ready can be cut down to minutes because the automation is easier to do on a combi machine. And then possibly even look at that pallet fed uh, uh, feeder and go to that cell concept. So that's a very, very uh, large group of projects that we have is checking out that specific work. Um, then the throughput speed, I already went through the example. Uh, many times what we see is people are always telling me that rule of thumb of 5,000 an hour is what we estimate for folding. And now with the machines today, the, the maximum speeds, you easily can see where you can, depending upon how you design the machine and what, what parts and features you put into it, we can do that two to three times better. Uh, stock uh, has a huge effect. Um, we are, are able now, a lot of times, the manufacturers are able to put um, an increase of production on even bad papers. So there's different roller choices available today. There's different guide choices and gripper choices and belt choices of how the sheets are moved through folders. It's not a necessarily a one, one type of machine fits all. And uh, we can get uh, difficult papers to move through machines because I know a lot of people are moving towards lighter stocks and less costly stocks. And sometimes those aren't so great to work with. And then the last one is. Uh, 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 replacing old assets. So constantly having people with 1990s and early 2000s vintage machines, they're costly. They don't run as quick, possibly disrepair. Uh, they're quite a bit of money to keep moving. And you have to have a maintenance talent and a, and a manual labor force that knows how to run manual machines. And you replace those assets sometimes at 2 to 3 to 1 and get the same amount of production through it. And you can kind of see how you know you can get a a 4,000 an hour machine um, with uh, quite a bit of downtime or maybe extra maintenance costs and put in a new machine that could maybe two or three to, three to one outperform that. And, and you end up with similar workflow, less labor, less costly maintenance, and so on and so forth. So I think that's kind of the overview of, the, of, of what we see in the market and what some of the processes and things we can, we can take a look at. Uh, one of the uh, wonderful things we had in this presentation today is we had one of our customers from uh, Virginia, Good Printers, join us today. They've had uh, a chance to do some of this and put in some newer machinery to take out some process steps and, and labor steps. And I think, uh, Tim, if you wouldn't mind jumping in and uh, moving on with uh, your portion, it would be great to uh, generate some questions toward the end also. 
And uh, sure. Jim, uh, just before well, before you do that, uh, Lance, by the way, thank you very much for that excellent overview. Uh, as we turn the program over to Tim, I'd like to uh, give a reminder to our audience to keep the questions coming by uh, using that Q&A button. Uh, we will have time for Q&A following uh, Tim's portion of the program. And with that, uh, Tim, please go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Pat. Um, like you said, I'm Tim Meredith. I'm the general manager of Good Printers in Bridgewater. We're located about two hours south of the uh, Washington metro area. And most of our work is generated out of that metro region. So company history, we've been around for quite a while. We were founded in 1902. Our primary business is still 40-inch offset print work. We run two 40-inch presses and some smaller presses as well, but uh, the, the most of it's coming off those two presses. We went into digital printing in uh, 2010. We went into mail services in 2011. We've also done a lot lately with uh, wide format printing and web to print services as well. We, we're pretty much your full gamut, full commercial shop. We do offset, digital, wide format as I spoke about, mailing, kitting, warehouse fulfillments, and uh, a lot of in foiling, embossing, all kinds of products in those ranges. I'd like to take a moment and uh, walk you through the problem we brought to MBO about going on two years now. We had a 16-page newsletter job that we've ran for probably over a decade. And this job would come in on a Friday night, or supposed to be by noon, but I think anyone in printing has been there. It's usually by end of day. The job would come in. It would be anywhere from 200 to a half million 16-page newsletters. Customer did not require a stitch. So years ago, we were running these as a 16-page signature and finishing it down to 8.5, 5.5 nested on our stitcher with a Z-knife off the end of it. So what we tried to do was take this 2335 sheet, run it straight off the folder all the way down to an 8.5, 5.5 nested piece. So we started doing this on old manual equipment probably in 2015 by using a 32 page off the end of a three unit folder. So we had a four unit fold running anywhere from three to 4,000 an hour, running three sets of slits. Um, that job was hard to make ready, hard to run consistent. And we started looking around for new technology. So we contacted MBO and said, here's the piece. We sent it up to them and their, and to their uh, technicians. They looked at it put together a kind of a scope of how they would go about it. They actually, I think, brought the H&H &H unit in from Germany, if I remember right, for the demo. We were able to go up to their showroom, uh, lay it out with their technicians, go over it, and uh, we actually shipped in some portion of that job and ran it in their showroom. So we were able to go from running, at best, three to 4,000 on old setup. Production speed now is over 7,000 an hour. I've actually seen it touch 10 in a, on a good, when every condition's right, humidity, paper, everything falls in line. So on the next slide, you can kind of see this. It's a little, a little hard to explain. So we were taking four 1117s, nesting them together, then going down to eight and a half, five and a half, all out of a 2335 sheet. No guillotine knife, no, no use of the stitcher, just straight from press to folder. That was the biggest reason we put in the M80, and after we got it on our floor, we realized the kind of the great scope of work we could throw at it. We've we've gained production speeds. To give you another example, we just we just had it running yesterday. A six panel, a 25 and a half by 11, tri folding, then folding down to eight and a half, five and a half. Um, we actually had it because of time constraints on an old folder and on this new M80. So our old folder, we were able to cruise at right around 8,500 sheets an hour. The new folder was running anywhere between 12.5 and 14.5 over a couple different shift changes. So as you can see, the, the production we've gotten off the units at times double what we've gotten off our old, old machinery. Uh, I believe on the next slide, we've got an actual video demonstration of that as well.
we did not actually ask him to wear that shirt, the operator, but uh, he's a big believer. So. <laughs> so that takes you about through some of the things we've seen from putting in the M80, and uh, I can answer more questions during the Q&A. Tim, uh, that was a great briefing. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, now uh, let's uh, let's take some questions. And again, uh, please do use that uh, Q and A feature to send us some. Uh, I'm going to begin with one for uh, for you, Tim. Uh, during his presentation, uh, Lance stressed that uh, one of the things uh, a plant needs to do in order to uh, optimize its folding operations is be be willing to change, be open to. Uh, uh, altering your routines uh, in the interest of achieving, you know, that greater efficiency. So my question is, uh, as a result of installing that M80 and achieving all of that uh, added efficiency, did you have to change anything? Was there anything you needed to be flexible about to make all of this work as well as it did? Uh, we made several changes, actually. We actually even changed the location of our folders to be able to get more room around the folder to get more material up to the machine so there wasn't so much back and forth of chasing down material and uh, things of that nature. We also ran a stacker in line with the folder, which we saw big production gains off that. So we, we'd never had a stacker in our facility before. So utilizing the stacker, getting our workflow ironed out to where we had, if we're running you know, 40,000 SIGs, we had enough room around that folder to put five or six skids up to that folder so they weren't having to come off. And we, we realized that if a machine's going to run at this kind of pace, that we have to have everything in order with the material handling and skids and where the skids are located. All those things have to come together to really achieve that top production speeds. Uh, Tim, here's a, here's if a I could add one thing, Pat. Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, Tim and I had a conversation, if, I, I guess it was last month or, or so, uh, and we were also talking about the whole concept of keeping the machine uh, in its maintenance, uh, and you know, it, it, it's kind of it, you have to change some of the views you have on the on the maintenance. And I think I, I can't remember if he used exactly these words, but it was more of a fix it when it's broke mentality in the older days versus now we have to you have to keep it up because you can't expect things to perform at levels like that without having proper maintenance and adjustments and calibration and so on. And truly automated machines are they're only going to be as good as as you know you your your upkeep and such. So um, I think that's a general market realization that's happening in the world. Uh, people used to just put in the and and I guess the manufacturers were 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 happy about it because you you know you could beat these things to death and they just keep folding. And that's you know that that's generally true for all the older folders that are out there in the market. They're they're just tanks. But uh, now you have a tank with some very automated features on it and special features, and they've got to be kept upgraded and 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 calibrated, or you know they have to be you know preventative maintenance or whatever the words are to do. And you have to take a you know once a year or maybe twice a year you have to take a pain and do that. So that's uh, that's a very important shift of change that we see across the market. That's correct. Uh, we use uh, plan downtime on the machine as well, usually just a couple hours a month to uh, go over any small issues that might have happened and and try to fix it before anything ever goes down and leaves us stranded. So we, we usually get by with 30 minutes a week or, or two hours a month of just light maintenance work. Uh, Lance, uh, you, you mentioned that there are 15,000 uh, folders uh, out there. Uh, I wondered uh, if you could say, what is the average age of those machines, and what's the single biggest reason that they're really not competitive anymore? Hmm. Well, um, I don't really have exact data on ages and such. Um, I, I know in the older days, we literally, in the older factories, we were shipping out you know, hundreds of folders a year. Uh, into the market for many, many, many years, and the, the, it just kept building up. And they had a they had a habit of not failing, right? They just don't. They're, they're built very robustly, and that that's true in in all the vendors that were building things out there. Um, and I would imagine you've got a late '90s to you know somewhere around the turn of the turn of the decade type of a 
2000, 2001 or two is probably a very good average. And boy, some of them are really old. And and then of course you did have a you know since 2007 and eight you had a few people putting things in. But nowadays we you know the the whole market doesn't put in uh, you know hundreds and hundreds of folders nowadays. Um, you know in the full size offset market I suppose there's probably you know, 40 machines sold in the United States uh, a year, and they're very. Some of them are incredibly special. So, that's kind of the market you're dealing with uh, on a volume basis, and what we're looking at today. Um, Lance, here's a here's a very specific uh, folding uh, situation question that uh, was pre-submitted, and I'll read it. It says, "Is there a way to automate folding and gluing?" 100 pound cover a 10 point Teslin, T E S L I N. We need an efficient way to fold 12 by 18 sheets down to 6 by 18 to produce smooth, high quality, heavy duty tags with RFID, RFID inlays embedded between substrate layers. That's a specialized fold if I, if I ever heard of one. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a heck of a question to ask in a webinar, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I Off the top of my head, I could never answer that. Yeah. It's, how uh, how frequently do you, do you see a, a fold that specialized? Probably probably not very often. Well, you know, maybe not with the RFID tag and such, but it, it's it's very common um, to get a question that comes in with, "Hey, I, I've got I'm doing this. The stock's too heavy. Uh, I need to score it. It's digitally printed, so my old scores crack. How do I handle that?" Uh, and can you build something that takes out the fact that I'm, I'm taking these two substrates into four different processes to get this done? So it's not unusual to have the question. Now, whether the 100-pound the cover and Teslin married together with an RFID tag is something we could do. I'd, we'd certainly like to try uh, and, and give it a shot. Uh, again, that's exactly the process we were talking about earlier. You know, that, that's not, hey, sell me one of those things so I can do this. That's, hey, I got this. And this is the really common thing. Most of the time what we're doing nowadays, and our whole sales team and, and, and technical team is this way, you walk into with a customer and they throw things on their desk and they go, I make you know, 400,000 of these a month. How do I get around the problem of touching it three times? Though that's the real process that's going on today. So I would say, Love to give it a shot, more than willing to give it a shot, and do what we can. Uh, we put pennies and um, uh, you know pa seed seed packets from uh, from garden shops and things inside of products. Uh, the H and H people put pills and capsules capsules inside of the of blister packs, and you know we have die cutting machines that go in line with folders now. They go in line with webs from digital print. So is there a chance we could do it? Yeah, probably there's something. Uh, maybe we could get around, you know, 70% of it, and take three processes out, and, uh, and only make it a two-stage. So, uh, here's a more general uh, question. Uh, I, I think that the, both of you could take a take a shot at. And Tim, perhaps you'd like to address this first. And it uh, reads: uh, Do you think the trend is printers adding more folding capabilities in-house or outsourcing to a dedicated converter slash finishing house. Well, uh, Tim, you pretty clearly have uh, added uh, folding capabilities, uh, possibly to the point where you don't uh, need to think about outsourcing anymore. Did you ever outsource any of your folding? Uh, is that something uh, that you, you don't have to uh, consider doing now, now that you've got that uh, automated and high-speed M80? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we used to outsource a little bit of folding for two reasons. One, we would just get inundated um, with sheets and just couldn't keep up, so we had to take some of the volume, send it out. And two, we would have some stuff that we just couldn't do in our machinery, such as a six panel. So when we put in this M80, we wanted to make sure we had a six panel, so we bought a 6442, which allowed us to do roll folds, things of that nature that we didn't used to be able to do in-house. As far as the capacity... We can't currently outprint our bindery. Um, the only time we would really have to outsource is just turnaround times just didn't make sense or something like that. But I personally don't see the trend going out to converter finishing houses just because of turnaround time, it, at least in the general market that we're in. If I had to go out of house to fold, I'm probably not going to get that job. And uh, Lance, uh, what, what's your take? Uh, 
trade folding, uh, that's still uh, that's still an element of the industry, or, or are you just seeing more uh, vertical integration? I think um, there still are trade binders certainly out there. Um, I think the trend, uh, if I had to to look at it without doing the math uh, for real, I think the trend that we feel is that people are pulling things in-house as much as possible. Um, what Tim said about the turnaround times is probably the driving factor in most of that. Uh, if, you know, you, 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 when you lose control of a job and you have to ship it you know, three hours down the road to do something that you've gotten and three hours back and wait for them to fold, and so on, you lose a little quality control possibly. You know, that doesn't fit the environment we're in right now where people are asking for things in 24 hours, not in you know, three weeks. You know, the, the, the old turnaround times are gone. Uh, and I, I'm sure it's only going to get worse. Um, what we do see, though, is we see uh, some of the specialty machines going into some of the trade binders and such. And that, that seems logical to us. Um, you'll find someone in an area that has a very special, like a PI folder that can, you know, can fold down medical pamphlets or something, and um, they have the ability to do that for a group of people because of the volumes are high. Uh, but <clears throat> and maybe pulling it in for one guy doing one job for one customer doesn't make sense to buy a machine. So maybe on some of the specialty folds that's not, but the commercial print market doesn't seem to be doing that. Lance, can you speak a little bit more about uh, identifying uh, bottlenecks? You, uh, you referred to it uh, briefly in your presentation. Uh, MBO sends personnel in to uh, you know, analyze operations, uh, you know, look for uh, places where throughput needs to be uh, improved. Uh, how, how do you do that? Do you, do you set targets? Uh, uh, do, do you uh, try to establish KPIs? How does it work? Well, uh, we have a fortunate um, business model within our, our group that we have some really talented people that um, have been in the industry a long time. Uh, we're, we're a bunch of old guys, I guess, that have been around the industry forever. And uh, uh, we kind of treat it as a consulting project. Uh, and most of the most effective projects we work on with folders in, uh, in the finishing side of life are, are treated that way. Um, you can this this you know, we we've, we've got it uh, following that paper path can identify a bottleneck quickly the minute you find out that um, I, I guess I keep coming back to this guillotine thing because we do find out now that a lot of they've consolidated the print quite a bit and you're ganging jobs together and you're forcing movement into a cutting environment uh, where you're you're changing format a lot. Here, you know, maybe people are buying standard sizes of paper, yet you're putting four or five different forms on it, and you must trim off edges in order to get it to go through your uh, your 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 perfect binder, let's say, uh, because it has a limitation on on edge trim. Well, traditionally, you would take that to the guillotine. You end up cutting sheets into two or three pieces, or you're four-sided trimming at three cuts a minute. And all of a sudden, you've got a bottleneck in time, and your folders are waiting for product, but the guillotines are having trouble getting it through. And God forbid you've got to do six cuts on a sheet or eight cuts on a sheet. So uh, you know, making sure that we put in cutting tools, chutes, vacuum, tubes, and things on the folder that can take that away consistently and keep your speeds up high makes all the sense in the world. So uh, that's just one, uh, one example of what you might be able to do there's even ink jetting going on on folders now, you know, putting a code on something that needs to be coded oh, sure, for a downstream yeah. process, things like that. Uh, Tim, uh, w with the installation of uh, your, your, your M80 system, uh, you can uh, produce a lot faster, uh, increase your throughput. I'm wondering, uh, in addition to those advantages, uh, are you now able to produce things that you couldn't do before you swapped out the three older uh, uh, folders that you had for the new M80, any new products, uh, uh, product op uh, applications available to you? Yes, we've uh, we've taken in a few. We've been able to do some roll folds. I think on the slides there was an example of it. But we actually did a um, piece that was like a pocket guide that was, I want to say, a 24-panel fold going through six uppers and then tri-folding down. So 
we've taken on some specialty work that we weren't able to achieve before, or that we had to outsource so that we were, you know, it was, it was harder for us to be competitive and turn the work quickly as we've spoken to. So, yeah, I would say we've been able to take more work. Uh, Lance, one thing that, uh, that that MBO has uh, has pioneered is what you, know, you have referred to as uh, the parking lot concept of uh, folding and finishing. And uh, in this uh, setup, I have some uh, static machines, uh, you know, of, of folders and finishers that I always use that I then am able to supplement with other machines for particular applications that I can wheel in and out. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, that was uh, done at good printers, but you certainly have done it uh, elsewhere. Can you just uh, just uh, just amplify on the description of the, the, the parking lot concept? Sure. Um, it, uh, it, the idea is that you have a core piece of business or a core machine that does a certain function that you typically always do, but there's trailing modules that could be shifted in and out to do the final piece and make it a complete process, right? So uh, it's a little less of a of a um, of an impact on just a on a on a static sheet fold, uh, but um, it, it still works the same. So the parking lot might be that you have a a single pair a single knife, uh, or maybe a parallel knife, or a glue module set up. Uh, is in a manual configuration with segmented rollers and segmented uh, or in, in glue plate lips to do a specific job. The machine is integrated now so that it can take all those different modules. So just because you bought, um, uh, you know, it, it, let's take let's take uh, Tim's piece. So he has a I think it was a six six four two was the configure, configuration. Um, the the last two is actually a Herzog and Hyman unit. Uh, it's a it was a it's a pharmaceutical unit with great big rollers, because by the time you folded that newsletter piece down, the thickness was so big it's hard to get through a standard unit. Uh, so he could have put in a, a maybe a knife to go back there. Uh, you could have put in after the second unit. You could have stuck in a um, a, a table to affix maybe a card even if you wanted to get really crazy, uh, and and then put the third unit after that. So the parking lot concept would be that you have three or four modules that can be put into a standard type of a configuration, ready and willing that you're able. And all you really need to do is plug them into the control system. Now many times you have, like, you know, you might not be able to get full functionality of automation out of all those controls because sometimes those units are, are rather special and they, it's not practical to automate something. Uh, but uh, you know, many times you can still get all the functionality out of them to get the job done. And taking the process steps out is probably the, you know, the most important part of the ROI. Take two processes and turn them into one, and you almost always will win. Tim, I wonder if uh, you could speak about uh, the uh, ergonomic uh, advantages of replacing three older uh, manually operated folders with a new uh, highly automated system. Uh, how's uh, that making life easier for your operators? You know, less bending, less lifting. Uh, why, why is it uh, why why is it why is it good for for them ergonomically? Sure. So one of the things we looked at in the beginning was either a pallet fed um, feeder or the continuous feed. We ended up after going back and forth for quite a while, realizing that we, we pretty much had to stick with a continuous feed just because of the vast array of work that we do. If we were folding, you know, particularly signatures or particularly half size sheets, we think we could have got away with a pallet fed model and probably made it even more ergonomic. But what we've been able to do and achieve that way is to put the stacker in. The stacker has pretty much made it so no one ever is bending down. They're taking off loads that are being sectioned out usually in 50s and 100 and we're putting them onto a pallet that's already lifted up to machine height that goes down as it fills up instead of having to reach down to the floor so the guys like running it um, it's instead of having to go up and down all day long that stacker's pretty much doing a lot of that work for them Lance do you want to hey, comment on uh, yeah go ahead yeah I think so um, I, it, I might not have done the best job of stressing that part of the machine as well as uh, I should have. Um, 
but you can imagine there is no possible way if you take a machine and a, an operating environment where you're producing something at four or five thousand an hour and just walk down to that machine no matter what it was and turn it up and the delivery on the end of it was three feet long and just spits out shingled product onto the onto the table you know the, the operator has no time to 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 fly anything at ten thousand an hour they maybe they could do it for 15 minutes or so but eventually you know they they will lose the battle or you'll have to start throwing more people at it and then your ROI goes away so um, different types of deliveries to do the right job is is a, is a big deal um, the minute you get up into uh, signatures coming off of a machine at eight nine ten thousand an hour you you basically have to put in a, a machine that is going to to, to stand them up properly into a stack and slow them down to the point and give the operator some dwell time to work. He still has to make touch-ups on the machine. And if you're a continuous feeder, you have to load paper. Uh, you have to still take the stack, put it on a skid. You have to have a skid raising device uh, you know, to get it at, at, at proper working level so you don't cause any problems with elbows and backs. You know, and all those things have to be looked at. That has nothing to do with the machine. What it has to do with is the fact is you're throwing product out the end of it two or three times faster than you ever were. So, and, and that's something in the older days. Nobody seemed to spend more than the minimum for a simple belt shingle table to go at the end of a folder. And you can you walk through most shops and you see them. Uh, and, the, and the new way of doing things is either to band it or put it into a stack and, and move it out onto a table so that it's, it's ready to be put on a skid in its form. Well, uh, we're coming up within just a couple of minutes of uh, 2 o'clock here, and I think we're uh, just about out of time for today. On behalf of Printing Impressions and MBO America, I want to uh, thank uh, Lance and Tim again for excellent presentations, and I particularly want to thank our audience for attending today's webinar. Now, please do be sure to check out our webinar page to get information on all of our, our, our archived as well as upcoming webinars. Uh, we would also be very appreciated if you would take just a minute to fill out the brief feedback survey that will uh, appear on your screen next. Your feedback really does help us improve the, uh, the webinars that we bring to you in the future. Again, thank you so much for, uh, for attending and for listening. Thanks again to our speakers. And I do hope to see all of you at upcoming Printing Impressions webinars in the future. Thanks very much.